C'est un juge à la Cour d'appel fédérale, euh, un juge dont, les, euh, dont la jurisprudence fait jurisprudence. Euh, C'est un juge très, très, très productif, qui travaille très fort, qui écrit beaucoup et qui est très, très bien respecté dans la communauté juridique, non seulement ici en Ontario, euh, mais à travers le Canada. I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Justice Stratus initially back when he was uh, a normal member of the Law Society of Upper Canada, but he wasn't normal even at that time. He was very. <laughs> He was a very hard-working member of the bar at the time, very productive, very well-known, uh, and it was uh, therefore uh, a great news to have learned that he had been appointed to the bench, uh, and I think I can speak for all of us at the Law Review and all of my colleagues uh, in the faculty at the Ottawa Law School that we are very pleased, delighted that he was able to take some time from his, uh, to make some time in his very busy schedule to be here with us. Donc, uh, without further ado, Monsieur le Juge Stratus. Yes. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate the words very much. At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers of this wonderful symposium for their hard organizational work. They've put together a superb program. And as all of you know, Section 1 is very much where the rubber hits the road in charter adjudication. It's where the essential balancing between the state's interests and rights claimants takes place and to seize upon the 30th anniversary of the Charter and to decide to focus this symposium on the place where the rubber hits the road, Section 1, is really a masterstroke by the organizers, and I congratulate them for that. Today, I'd like to offer some thoughts about decision-making under Section 1 of the Charter and what some say about the legitimacy of that decision-making. And I'd like to move towards the end of my presentation to offer some suggestions for a better approach, one that might help to minimize concerns about the legitimacy of charter adjudication. At the outset, let me state my essential thesis. As we all know, and as many will say today, decision-making under Section 1 of the Charter has a substantial policy component. And by virtue of judges' background and training, the litigation procedures that we must follow, the rules of evidence that shackle us, and other constraints, some say we are not particularly well suited to the policy analysis and decision making required under Section 1 of the Charter. But whether we like it or not, the truth is, as we all know, Deciding cases fairly under Section 1 is part of our job description. We are not to shy away from it, but rather to wade into Section 1 when we need to, and to get it right. When we are engaged in that task, in my view, there are things we as judges can do that will help to enhance the legitimacy charter decision-making, and that's where I'll end my presentation. Let me begin with a few opening words about the Section 1 task. We're all familiar, of course, with the famous Oaks test. It, I'm sure someone's going to keep count how many times someone says the word Oaks today. It's obvious that the test calls upon many of the skills and experience of policy analysts and policy decision-makers. We have to decide at the outset the objective of legislation. In other words, we have to discern the policy. Then we have to assess whether it's pressing and substantial. In other words, weigh the policy and form a value judgment about whether it meets a certain subjective threshold, the threshold of being significant enough to outweigh a charter right or freedom. Next, as you all know, is the proportionality part of the test comprised of three parts. First, do the means chosen by the legislation further the objective? In other words, we assess whether the choice of means manifested in the legislation is efficacious in the sense that it furthers the government's policy objective. 
This is the stuff of policy, analysis, of policy analysts. They assess the efficaciousness of means in achieving policy objectives. The second part of the proportionality test, as we all know, is whether the means chosen by Parliament or the legislatures to meet the policy objective affect rights and freedoms as little as possible. Again, this is what policy analysts do. And on top of this, we have to assess, under the minimal impairment test, just how fussy we will be. How much leeway should the government be given? How much deference should be accorded in assessing minimal impairment? That itself is the central consideration calling for the uh, calling for the skills and experience of policy analysts and decision makers. And finally, as you know, there is the comparison of the deleterious effects of the measure and its beneficial impacts. Here, we are at the bullseye of policy analysis and decision making. Let's move on now to what some say about our skills, abilities, and capacities to engage in that task. Are we particularly suited to it? How skilled able and capable are we in the craft of policy analysis and decision making? Well, well how, how skilled and able and capable are we to engage in that sort of policy analysis? Well, let me put it this way. In an ideal world, if you were to choose a group of people to engage in a sort of policy analysis and decision making called, called for under the Oakes test, uh, would you really select people like us? I mean, I mean, look at me. Would you choose me? I'd hazard to guess. Demographically speaking, many of us come from families of above average income. Most are Caucasian, almost all are 50 years old, and still, most are male. This is not a surprise, unfortunately, because the demographics of the current judiciary reflect the demographics of the senior levels of the bar. And we are just, after all, older lawyers. Most of us worked extremely hard before entering the judiciary. Is someone who works six or seven days a week, 10 hours a day or more, for 20 or 30 years as a lawyer, is that person the sort of person who's ideally suited to engage in policy analysis and decision making under others? And given how judges like me do our judgments, given the constraints acting upon us, would you really choose us as people to make these policy analyses and decisions? Well, look, first, we're a pretty cloistered bunch. We don't really hang out with many folks. We don't get exposed to a lot of stuff. Our jobs require us, among other things, to read factums on weekends. Hardly the fare of good policy analysis. Good policy analysis and decision making needs good access to facts and good access to objective viewpoints. What do we get in courts? Well, in the first instance, the facts come from the evidence that the parties give us. The doctrine of judicial notice prevents us from getting access to other evidence. We can't Google to get our facts. On appeal, the facts come from the findings of the first instance judge. Absent a demonstration of palpable and overriding error, we're stuck with those facts. There are severe limitations on appeal on the admissibility of new facts. So, as policy analysts and decision makers on appeal, in terms of the factual inputs for that, we are constrained. We are policy analysts and rarely able to change the factual inputs into the analysis. Now let's turn to the parties. Usually the parties are those who have a vital or vested interest in the outcome. After all, that's how they get standing to appear before us. We don't often get parties who, out of the goodness of their hearts, pay lawyers big dollars to appear before us just to help us out. 
The factual inputs, viewpoints, and recommendations for our policy analysis and decision making are carefully selected by non-neutral parties. Do interveners help to mitigate this? Well, sure they do, but they too have their own interests and viewpoints. And most rules of court prevent them from adducing evidence. On that subject, you know there's many privileges, such as crown privilege, which of necessity can impede access to information we need to make policy decisions. <coughs> and possible techniques for the receipt of such evidence, such as closed courtrooms, are generally frowned upon. A special word about experts is now warranted. They're essential in many Section 1 cases involving policy analysis and decision making, but they too are carefully selected and vetted by the parties. True, rules of court, recent reforms are changing <coughs> stuff about experts, imposing new requirements of independence and objectivity, but it remains that the experts that we see for the purposes of Section 1 decisions are usually selected and vetted by someone who has a vested interest in the outcome of the case. Of course, a major constraint is time, workload, and money. The parties have financial limits. This especially matters in the area of experts. Experts are expensive, and the best ones are really expensive. And as for the judges, we're expected to get judgments out quickly, and we have many other important cases to deal with too. The reality that that leads us to is that the policy analysis and decision making under Oaks is hurried. Think about this for a moment. It is quite possible that the excruciatingly difficult issue of assisted suicide will arrive again at the Supreme Court of Canada. Despite its heavy workload, some 70 difficult cases and 600 applications for leave every year and other public responsibilities, after several months of reserve on that case, many of us will start to grumble about why they're taking so long. That's the, that's the highest court in the country, not a busy, sometimes chaotic, overwhelmed trial court. And what resources do the judges have? A nice library filled with mainly law books. And some courts, but not all courts, have a really intelligent and hardworking law clerk. Now, I think by now, I've gone on long enough, you have my essential point. Judges face considerable challenges in engaging in the sort of policy analysis and decision making required under the Oaks test. And as is obvious, many of these considerations lead some to question the legit legitimacy of judges embarking upon this enterprise. Yet, as I said at the outset, regardless of that, under our constitutional framework, it's mainly the judges who have this task, and they are obligated by their oaths and by the Constitution to discharge them. Despite the challenges and questions about legitimacy, judges cannot shy away from their task of adjudicating Section 1 issues, and in doing so, with fairness, objectivity, and balance. So what can be done? What can be done in a situation where judges are hobbled by practical constraints and people are concerned about the very legitimacy of things the judges have to do? What can be done? Well, at the outset, I'm going to flag some questions. These are for others some of you to explore and answer, not for me. <clears throat> Other nations have developed special procedures and support bodies for the adjudication of issues of constitutionalized human rights or international treaty created human rights. And these special procedures and support bodies are intended to better empower decision makers to engage in policy analysis and decision making. Should these sorts of things be considered? Are they worth the time and financial cost? Are they bad because they add to the factual and other inputs that we receive but relegate actual litigants to insignificance? 
These questions can multiply. They're complicated, and these questions, as I said, are not for me to speak about today. But one thing that we'll speak about is the way in which judges should engage in their task of policy analysis and decision making under oaths, and how they should express it in their decisions. Here, like Justice Sharp, I applaud the first judges who dealt with the Charter. In their decisions, they were obsessed about the legitimacy of what they were doing. We see this from their reasons for judgment. There, we see pages and pages of careful assessment of sources and influence for their policy analysis. To the extent possible, they did not just say what they happened to think at the time. For example, under the minimal impairment test, often they did not just base their decisions on their personal impressions. That, they understood, might expose them to the sorts of challenges and questions about legitimacy I've mentioned. Challenges and questions that are based on the frailty of the judge as policy analyst and decision maker. Rather, what they did is, in assessing the minimal impairment test, the early judges tried to ground their decisions on external sources and indicators of what is acceptable in a free and democratic society. Do you remember some of these early cases? Justice Sharp appointed us this morning with Big M Drug Mart. He mentioned Justice Dixon there, grounded his judgment in history, philosophy, learning, and more. You see in the early jurisprudence plenty of comparative law, examinations of other countries' laws, agreed upon international <coughs> instruments and decisions based on them, and other countries' court decisions under their domestic constitutions. Reliance on all these sources helps to ground our Section 1 decisions on external sources and indicators of what is acceptable in a free and democratic society. It isn't just the judge, with all of his frailties, all of his or her frailties and limitations, having his or her own say. It is an open line show. As examples of the early approach, and this will appear in my paper, which I hope the Law Review will see fit to publish. Big M, Drug Mart, Valenti, Mills, Lyons, Smith, Valiancourt, Catroni, all of these, just to name one instrument, looked and analyzed with great sensitivity the European Convention of Human Rights and the jurisprudence under it. Early cases also looked south of the border, and they did so with due caution. In the motor vehicle reference, Justice Lemaire, as he then was, cautioned, quote, we would do our own constitution a disservice to simply allow the American debate to define the issue for us, all the while ignoring the truly fundamental structural differences between the two constitutions, end quote. But still, back then, the American law was examined. It was sometimes accepted, sometimes not. In examining under Section 1 what is reasonable in a free and democratic society, in engaging in the policy analysis and decision making under oaths, why don't we look more often carefully at what's going on just 100 kilometers south of us? There we have a real live, a real life laboratory that for 225 years now has been running experiments, testing what is the proper balance between governmental interests and fundamental human rights. Yes, sometimes over that 225 years they got it wrong. Sometimes terribly so. But why do we not more often under Section 1 look at what that country has done and ground some of our Section 1 decisions in our conclusions on their stuff? Conclusions that may be approving or disapproving of what they've done. It's surprising to me that more often we don't bother to look just 100 kilometers south of here. You know, the early cases also looked a lot to academic writings. One need only, just to take one example, look at the case of Viancourt and the reliance that the Supreme Court placed in that case on the learned and thoughtful works of the academics who had time to study the effects 
of the felony murder provisions in Canada. Some, such as Justice Wilson, who I had the honor to clerk for, she tried to ground many of her decisions in some of our most renowned philosophers. But for a moment to anticipate a criticism, back then that was just not, that was not just a thing that so-called liberal judges did. Uh, in Dolphin Delivery, a decision that many consider to be a rather conservative decision written by Justice McIntyre, he grounded his views on philosophical works as well. In that case, John, Stewart's, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. I have a sense that in the early decisions, there was a much greater reliance on extraneous materials like royal commissions and reports. And this is not just in the early cases something the Supreme Court did. It pervaded, as I'll show in my paper, uh, the thoughts of lower courts as well. What's happening today? Well, judging by the reasons of most courts on Section 1 issues, and here I'm speaking of all courts, not just the Supreme Court, there seems to be far less concern about grounding the analysis on the sorts of external matters I've mentioned, especially on the issue of minimum impairment. I'll offer just one example, and it happens to be from the Supreme Court. And the case I'd cite is Multani, the case about the student who wanted to wear a kerpan uh, in school in accordance with his religious faith. The majority of the court held that the student could do so under certain conditions. The court's section one analysis, however, consists largely of its own views and assessments, and I might add, excellent argumentation, but with limited sourcing. The sourcing was all domestic. Obviously, it's not for me to comment on the substance of Multani. I'm not here to talk about whether it's right or wrong, nor am I singling it out. It's an exam one example of many in all courts these days. My purpose is simply to note this case as an example of a recent trend one that causes me to gaze longly, longingly at the older cases, such as Big M Drug Mart, the case Justice Sharp mentioned, with their seeming obsession about sourcing. What sourcing does is it removes it from the judge subject to limitations, and provides a wider basis and justification for decisions, and enhances legitimacy. Now, in saying this, and in talking about Multani, I'm not blaming the court. Perhaps the problem was that counsel just failed to supply material to the court. Courts are reluctant to engage in their own research and surprise parties with their, with their research in the judgments. That's another limitation that we have. Perhaps one solution is to do more to educate counsel about what they need to do in a proper Section 1 case. The fact is that many who litigate these issues are really private law lawyers, unacquainted with the special qualities and challenges of Section 1 cases. Or perhaps counsel are not to blame at all. Maybe there weren't enough useful or timely academic articles either here or abroad on point. I'm summing up now, but underneath these musings on my part, is what I think is an important insight. The proper adjudication of Section 1 issues, adjudication with ample sourcing and grounding, is not just something for the judges. It requires contributions from and partnership with the profession, the academy, and perhaps others. All have a very big part to play. Summing up, here's my concluding thought. The route to greater legitimacy and respect for Section 1 adjudication, the policy analysis and decision makings that we do under the Oaks test. That lies in assiduous investigation, assessment, and articulation of sources. And that task, ultimately resting on the judges, is not for the judges alone. For that reason, I again applaud this symposium and all of the lawyers, academics, and judges presenting today, giving us Section 1 insights that we badly need. Thank you very much.
I'd like to open the room to questions. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Justice Strauss. Uh, I uh, really enjoyed the second half of your talk, but I want to question you on the first. Sure. Uh, because I think it's based, and the critique of judges in the Section 1 analysis compared to policymakers is based on uh, a mythology of what happens at the policymaking process and, and who those people are. And so in answer to your first question, would you choose you? I would. I would choose you uh, to look at the policy because I think you're not that much different than the people making uh, the policy choices. And so I, and I'll let you come back to it, but I, just three quick points. Sure. First, you talked about the difference between judges and policymakers in terms of the people who occupy the positions. I don't think that the demographic makeup of senior policy uh, ranks in Canada are all that different than the ranks of the judiciary. And in terms of education, I think that the, uh, the um, similarities are greater than the differences. In terms of the process, you mentioned and focused on the fact that in um, adjudication, we have non-neutral parties bringing forward the arguments before the judges. I think that's also true of the policymaking process. More and more now, we have interest groups involved at the very beginning of the policymaking process. We then have that mediated through uh, a neutral bureaucracy, but ultimately the decisions are made and implemented by a partisan government. So I'm not convinced that it's a neutral process uh, at the policymaking process. And then the third one is the constraints in terms of finances and time. I think those constraints apply at the policymaking process as well, particularly now in a time of budgetary constraint where we see entire uh, sections of the government being uh, underfunded and the move away from evidence-based policymaking under this government, but also previous governments. If you think about criminal policy making at this point in time, it's being made on the fly. It's ignoring uh, social science evidence. I'm not convinced that the constraints you identify in terms of what the judges have to deal with aren't also applying to the policymaking process. So I think that your uh, prescriptions for improving the Section 1 process are right on the mark. But I think the need for an improvement is perhaps not as um, acute as many argue because I don't see that there's such a, a huge uh, difference between what's happening in the courts and the expertise that judges are able to bring to the uh, matter as there is in the actual policymaking process. Uh, great points. I, I'll respond to some of them. First of all, it's, it's very kind of you to say what you said about me. But, <laughs> but. Uh, there is there is an essential problem. <coughs> Let me start with your second point. Perhaps that's better. For the purpose of illustrating the issue, I did. You are correct. I held up an idealized view of what policy analysts do uh, in the effort to try to paint a clear picture of the constraints that we work under. But. That does not reduce the constraints that we work under to not. And it certainly means that, and I hope I've made my point clear, that the constraints are real and should uh, pose a challenge to any judge faced with these issues. Uh, as to the current efficacy of, of policy making, of course, I can't comment on that, uh, except Again, to reassert, I was, I was putting forward an idealized vision of policy. That being said, even comparing against real-life policymakers who are subject to uh, constraints from people instructing them that may or may not exist, or subject to financial limitations and so on, the fact remains that their sources of information I would submit uh, and the ability that they have to look into an issue is far greater than us. Let me put it to you this way. I, I've sometimes in explaining the role of a judge, I've sometimes put it this way. You have to realize that all of the submissions we get in court are a form of, maybe I'm overstating a bit, but they're a form of commercial free speech, okay? People represented by paid lawyers are putting forward their best view of what's going on. Um, the situation is analogous, not exactly the same, but analogous to you during election campaigns when you watch all the election commercials. Can you make 
a really good decision on the basis of the self-interested speech you get. When you add that to the other constraints we have, like I can't do my own research because I don't have a law, a library, like law library, I don't have the requisite training to do it, and I can't surprise parties with my own research because I'm subject to natural justice limitations, chance for them to comment on things. When you add all of that up, I think my point still stands clear that we're greatly challenged in the policy process. The best we can do, I think, is at least to take it beyond our own limitations by at least making the best effort we can to ground our decision making in something more than just what we think. But I thank you. That was a great question, filled with good insights. Thank you. Um, as someone who tends to, to look at the role of judges in the policy making process and, and to despair at that, because I tend to find that that when judge, when judges make the decisions that you pointed out, they're very limited in the sources they can look at. Whereas um, in, in the broader world, where we can look at multiple sources, uh, the different policy options really can compete against each other in a marketplace of ideas, and then the most popularly supported idea will prevail. Um, so when I when I heard your speech, it, it was very hopeful and inspiring to to hear members of the judiciary expressing similar viewpoints as mine. One comment, um, sorry, more more of a question I have is, given the limitations that we face today with uh, precedent and uh, the the rules of natural justice that you commented, is there any possibility for incremental change without a, a fundamental restructuring of how um, our judiciary approaches Section One? Is there that? possibility at the trial level and, and bringing it up that we may um, remove the judges as much as possible from the policy making aspects? Well, it's hard to remove judges from the policy making aspects because we have to decide these issues and the issues by their nature, many of them are laden and imbued with, with uh, policy considerations. I think it's unavoidable. As to what can be done to improve the situation, that's very much for you and others interested in reform or those not interested in reform to discuss and talk about. My role as a judge, I obviously can't, can't discuss it. Uh, fundamentally, these issues end up being policy decisions about how society wants charter cases to be adjudicated. Lest I leave you with an overly pessimistic view of judges and charter decision making, there are some really wonderful things that happen. One is to a person, in my experience, albeit only two years and, and three months uh, of being a judge, to a person, each and every judge, in my experience, has huge good faith and a giant work ethic to try to get it right. The second thing that, and more important if you ask me, is our independence. We are completely independent to do what we think is appropriate on the facts and the law. And that we must treasure in this country because many, many countries don't have that. Fortunately, that's the last question that we can take. And uh, I'd like to, um, again, once again, uh, thank uh, Justice Stratitz. So please let's take a moment. I might add, I'm here all day, so if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to talk.